Hi, this is Emerald and welcome to the Diamond Net and today I'm going to be talking to you about projection. Alright, so of course this video is all about projection but I wanted to tell you how we're going to approach this topic. So the first part of the video will be all about like how projection works and I'll give you guys some personal anecdotes and some examples and then toward the end of the video I'll actually be giving you a five step process for becoming aware of projection so that we can actually see reality for what it really is underneath those projections. So stay tuned for that at the end. So what is projection? Well, you might have heard of the concept of psychological projection, where a person basically projects onto others uh, something that isn't necessarily there. So let's say that the person who's doing the projecting, let's say, has a certain thought process that they're always in, where they're always uh, judging people a certain way. And then they get nervous because they're afraid that other people are judging them the same way and they're sure that they are. But they're not really sure that that's happening. This is just a projection and it's an assumption based on some underlying tendencies that they have that they may not be aware of. So this is true of psychological projection, but psychological projection is just a really specific form of projection. Projection is actually a lot more broader in scope than that. So the way I define projection is the process by which human beings encode meaning onto reality. So we have our intellect, our thoughts, and then we have reality, and there's a disconnect between those two things because reality inherently is empty of meaning in the sense of intellectual meaning until a human being comes along and encodes reality with meaning for themselves. And so it's really the process by which human beings superimpose meaning and value onto reality at large. So when a person is projecting, it works a lot like the projector in the movie theater, which is why it has its name. So you have the projector, which has an image, and then you have the screen that it's projecting that image onto. And so in this scenario, reality itself is the screen, and the projection is all of the fodder of the human intellect. All right, so before I get going with the video, I want to give you guys a couple of personal anecdotes of when I first realized that I was projecting things onto reality that weren't necessarily there. Uh, so the first example was when I was 15, and I was in high school, and I was taking an art course there. And, you know, when I first went in, I didn't really understand that, you know, what I was seeing and the thing that I was projecting onto what I was seeing were two fundamentally different things. And so whenever I would go to, let's say, try to draw a table or something like that, I would kind of draw it through the projection of my idea of what a table is. It's like, okay, well, a table, it has like a square top, and so I draw like a square, and then it has legs coming out from it, and so like legs would be going in different directions there. And I would just try to sort of draw my symbolic understanding of what a table is. But when you're actually looking at a table and you're looking at your experience of your visual plane, you know, it depends on what perspective you're in, you know, and chances are it's not really going to look anything like the symbol for table that you have in your mind because that symbol is just a projection onto reality that makes it easier for us to function. And so when I noticed that I was projecting things onto real reality, I realized, oh my gosh, I have been living on this planet for 15 years and I've never seen a single thing in my life. I've only ever been experiencing reality through my projection onto it. And once I realized that and I learned to be able to see what I was actually seeing and not just see what I was thinking or what my intellect was superimposing onto things, it was like things became incredibly clear. And once I realized that, my art skills like improved drastically because then I was realizing, oh, I know exactly what I'm supposed to be drawing because it's right here in reality. I don't have to consult my mind about it at all because the mind just can give me symbols and things like that. But if I actually look, I can see reality for what it is. And that was just mind-blowing. It was, it was like almost like a mini enlightenment in and of itself because it was like I could finally see. Now during this scenario, I didn't realize really how deep the implications went about this phenomenon of like sort of projecting symbols over reality or projecting whatever our understanding is of things over reality. And so I just thought it was really cool in relation to being able to paint and to draw and that I could finally see things. 
But what I didn't realize is really what the implications were for personal relationships and this tendency toward projection. And so I was actually uh, 20 and having one of my experiences of ego transcendence, it was my second one, and I was at like this small like house party with these guys and I've told this story like in other videos so I apologize if it's like a repeat story for you guys but these guys they had um, they had this cute little dog a cute little puggle and you know they they really loved this dog but they would always like sort of you know like do the cute animal thing where they would sort of like give the dog a voice and sort of like you know sort of intimate what the dog was thinking and like what the dog was into and you know and it, it, nothing really struck me as off about this you know I saw them do this all the time it's just something that people tend to do with cute animals now when I had the experience of ego transcendence I was witnessing them interacting with the dog in this way and I started to get really really sad you know and uh, like I thought that I, at first I was sad for the dog because they were doing this to the dog but then I realized no I'm not sad for the dog the dog is fine but what's sad is that you know these guys don't know the dog at all they just know their projection onto the dog you know and even though I'm sure if you had asked them like oh you know that you know like this isn't really how the dog's personality is they would be able to say oh of course it's not but on some level they believe that the projections they were making onto the dog were true of the dog and so they weren't actually able to pick up on the dog's personality which I was noticing at the time was actually quite different from the things they were projecting onto her and so in experiencing the the sorrow emotion that I was feeling in witnessing these guys interact with this dog and there being such a clear incongruence with the reality of the matter, a bigger insight sort of swept over me. And there was like this deep intuition that, that like this is the problem with human relationships. You know, this is what keeps people sort of insulated from one another. It's what keeps us in our own little bubble and makes us feel isolated without connection. Because essentially, human beings tendency for projection is so strong and so subtle as well that we often go around and we just live in our little idea bubbles and those don't really interact with one another and you know and then we think oh I'm around all of these people and I have friends so why is it that I feel so isolated why is it that I feel completely alone and the reason why that is is because our ideas have superimposed onto reality making it impossible to see our friends and our family members and especially our significant others for who they actually are and so we're only ever interacting with our thoughts surrounding that person and our projections onto that person so with this I want to make a distinction between two different types of projection so I'll call one subtle projection and the other gross projection so gross projection would be something like I had experienced with the painting where it was like applied to all of reality so it's essentially being able to look out into reality and then everything is sort of seemingly separate and like you can label everything so that's a wall that's a window that's a tree that's a door that's a this that's a that so and this type of projection is actually somewhat necessary in order to function practically the problem comes when we're unconscious to that projection and it makes us to where we're actually insulated from our actual experience of reality from the thoughts about that reality now the other one would be like subtle projection so this is kind of like psychological projection and it's very particularized depending on who we're interacting with and what our expectations, needs, desires, worldview, and unconscious everything being projected onto that person. And if we don't realize that that's happening, what will happen is that we can really come up with different motivations than that person has, and we can also be insulated from our experience of the relationship with that person. So an example of a gross projection would be like calling a chair a chair. And then an example of a subtle projection would be like projecting thoughts and intentions over a person when they don't have those thoughts or intentions. So you might wonder, are you projecting or am I projecting? And the answer is yes, because everyone has to project for practical purposes. So 
Essentially, projection exists for the practical purpose of being able to encode meaning onto reality to make it functional for us. So if we weren't able to project onto reality or ideas and meaning, we wouldn't be able to make sense of what we need to do practically to get by in life. And so it would almost be like every day or every moment, your slate would be completely wiped clean of all of the things that you've learned about reality. So you would be essentially like a newborn in the sense of what you know. You know, so you wouldn't look at a chair and think, oh, that's a chair, I need to sit in that. You wouldn't have any kind of concept about what it was. You know, and so it allows us to take our past experiences and what we've learned from our past experiences and be able to project it onto our current reality in order that we can actually make wise decisions and be able to function. So first and foremost, projection is a form of meaning making and it allows us to use our intellect to create a mental model of reality. So one example of this that I think will really show the practical value of being able to project meaning onto things is language. Language itself is just a bunch of sounds. If we weren't able to project meaning onto those sounds, we wouldn't be able to communicate and we wouldn't be able to label things a particular way and to have a more complex understanding through our intellectual lens. So let's take the word horse, for example. So the word horse doesn't actually have anything to do with the animal that is a horse. That's just the sound and the collection of letters that we use as a symbol for that animal. So that whenever we hear someone say, oh, I saw a horse the other day, we know what the heck they're talking about. You know, if we didn't have like the ability for language, well, number one, we wouldn't know anything that was going on in that sentence. They wouldn't be able to communicate any of those concepts to us. But because we can project meaning onto language and because we can project meaning onto the things that language describes, we can actually like create coherent sentences and convey thoughts in a complex way. So even though projection has a negative connotation, it's important to realize that projection itself is quite neutral. Now the problem isn't that we project onto reality, that's necessary. The problem happens when we're projecting onto reality and we're not realizing that we're projecting onto reality, when we're unconscious to it. And when we don't realize that we're projecting, what happens is that our tendency for projection gets relegated to the shadow. It gets repressed so that we're not aware of it at all. And then the tendency for projection sort of denigrates, you know, it becomes a lower form of itself. Where we start projecting things that, you know, yield poor results in life and make us less conscious of things in general. So having said that, I want to talk about what I would call the greatest double-edged sword of being human. And that's the human intellect. So the human intellect is both humanity's greatest strength and its greatest weakness as well. So in the sense that it's a strength, it's what allows us to create complex civilizations, technology, tools, ideologies. Um, it's what allows us to learn more about this planet and about space and about reality in general. And it allows us to function in a really, really effective way for creating new things. And these are the things that really make humanity unique. So it's our ability to make meaning and remember meaning and then project that meaning onto reality that allows us to do these things. Now the other side of the coin to all of these positive things about the human intellect, the human intellect is so complex and can be so airtight seeming that we can be completely wrapped up in a worldview and a projection about reality so much so that we don't realize that we're not even experiencing reality itself. So it makes us very ungrounded and blind to things about our reality that are happening both internally, like emotionally and intellectually, and then also the external aspect as well. We can ignore things about reality if it contradicts our worldview. So for example, if we carry around the belief that we're a happy person and that's like a really, really strong belief that we can't really see past, then we might miss that we have other emotions going on there other than happiness. We might miss that maybe we have some underlying anger or maybe we have some underlying sadness going on. But we've slapped the label of happy over it. We've projected that label and so we don't see it. In fact, a trend that I notice is that a lot of intelligent and intellectually oriented people tend to become very, very unconscious. And this is because they have 
such a great aptitude for creating projections onto reality that are relatively sound and logical that they think that their projection onto reality is reality itself. They believe their ideologies and their ideas about things are literally true. So sometimes this manifests in not being able to get away from a particular ideology. So for example, like an ideology is kind of a lens for looking at reality and it kind of almost in a sense functions in a technological way. And it, it, there are some practical reasons for it. But in order to function within an ideology, you have to sort of put on ideology goggles. You know, so it's always going to distort reality somewhat because you're not really experiencing reality as it is. You're experiencing it through the projection of your thoughts and ideas and your ideology as a worldview. So a lot of times intelligent people tend to fall into this trap of not being able to take off those ideological goggles and also not being able to put on other sets of ideological goggles to see what other perspectives are like. But sometimes this tendency for projection also manifests in more subtle ways, like just not being able to see reality without always deferring to symbols. But that worldview becomes really unstable and it actually opens them up to a lot of manipulation and just ungroundedness in general where they don't really have a firm, solid foundation in reality. But on the flip side of that, if we can actually see reality for what it is, we can be very firmly grounded in what's actually true. The truth with a capital T. And when we do this, we're able to be a lot wiser and we're able to actually uh, function better in a practical sense too because we're not being swept this way and that way by our ideas. We can recognize an idea and a projection as a projection and so we can buy into them as far as it's useful to us but then detach from it as soon as it's not useful to us because we realize it's just a projection. So here are some problems that unconscious projection causes. Now again, projection here is not the issue, it's that we're unaware of it. All right, and the first one is inability for accurate perception, which means that we can't really receive wisdom or insights. And so we might make a lot of foolish decisions from this because we're not really rea interacting with reality itself. We're interacting with our idea about reality. All right, the second problem that unconscious projection causes is instability. So essentially, if we're building our house in an, on an unsolid foundation, but we believe it's a solid foundation, this is going to leave our house very, very susceptible to crumbling and falling. So likewise, if we think of ourselves as that house, what it is is that if we believe that our projection onto reality is reality itself, we're going to think that we're a lot more stable than we are. But the problem is that, you know, what will end up happening is that beliefs will come at us or different ideas that contradict our worldview will come at us and we have to like sort of shut down and we have to repress away certain aspects of reality. And so we leave ourselves open to all kinds of neuroses and all kinds of, uh, you know, potentials for breakdowns really ultimately. Now the third problem with unconscious projection is that we tend to feel isolated or lonely very easily. So again, if everybody is projecting their ideas onto reality and we're all psychologically projecting onto one another, again, we're not really going to be able to have any sense of intimacy or connection with that other person because we're only experiencing them through the projection and the projection insulates us from an actual awareness of them. And so this becomes a problem like I had mentioned earlier with the dog situation where you might believe that you know you're thinking correctly about another person or maybe even sometimes an animal but really what it is is you're just superimposing your own needs desires and um, unconscious baggage onto that person this tendency results in shallow relationships based only on attachment and codependency where the other person merely becomes a projection screen for our own subconscious needs, insecurities, desires, and fears. So if we never realize, oh, I'm projecting, and we don't realize that he's projecting or she's projecting onto us, we won't realize why we never really feel seen by other people because we won't even really necessarily feel seen by ourselves. And the fourth and last problem that I'm going to mention in this video with unconscious projection is that we end up buying into a lot of irrational fears and not really realizing that our fears aren't really grounded in reality. So to give a really relatable example that many of us can maybe relate to as children is that 
a lot of times children will think, oh, there's a monster in the room with me or there's a monster under the bed when, you know, they're expected to go to sleep in a dark room alone. Now, this makes sense because ultimately, you know, we didn't really evolve in such a way that, you know, children should be sleeping alone in the dark. You know, to, to a child, you know, their instincts tell them alone plus dark equals I'm dead, you know, and that's how it would have been, you know, back in the earliest days of humanity. And it was really only very recently that we started to sleep in our own bedrooms, maybe the Victorian era or some other time like that. You know, mostly families slept always in the same area. But in our culture, you know, it's very common for children to sleep alone in their own bed. And so oftentimes what happens is that you know, they start to get that fear that rises up, that triggered fight or flight mechanism because they sense that they're in danger, but they don't necessarily know what the danger is. And so they go into their imagination and they tap into the ancestral memory of all of the children who have been abandoned you know, in the wilderness and have been torn limb from limb by various beasts of the wild and have been eaten alive. And essentially what happens is they start to get these images popping up that they then project onto reality. And so the projection comes when they start to see fangs and claws and slithering tails and lots of fur. And now they've projected this archetypal image of the monster into their reality because they know that they feel the fear that those children who were actually accosted by various animals but now they're seeing these creatures that are really an amalgamation of all of those beasts put together and this is why monsters are always similar to animals but they're all very different because there's like they're essentially a hodgepodge of all the different animals and sometimes even a hodgepodge of ill-intentioned human beings like mixed in with that which would also have been um, that would also have been a danger back when we were living more in the wilderness, what we evolved for. So it really makes sense that so many children project the image of the monster under their bed because the, under the bed is a place where they're not seeing under, it's right beneath them. They feel vulnerable for some reason, but they can't necessarily place why they feel vulnerable. And so they project the image of the monster in relation to the feeling to make it make more sense to them. It's like, well, oh, if I feel this way, if I feel like I'm going to be ripped limb from limb by various beasts, then, you know, there must be some beast in here. So this is the projection that comes from the subconscious mind of the child, you know, and really taps into that universal ancestral memories that we have. Um, and if you're familiar with Jungian psychology, it's something that Jung talked about um, extensively is um, ancestral memory. But this tendency to project those monsters under the bed isn't just unique to children. Adults have our own forms of monsters under the bed. And we tend to find ourselves believing in things that are not true and things that drive us nuts about reality and really like leave us like hung up on certain things and so that's like the equivalent of having monsters under the bed is maybe like fearing that we're not worth anything or fearing that you know other people look upon us in such a way that it invalidates us you know and all of these are not grounded in reality you know, all of these fears are just like the fodder of the human mind being projected onto reality. So how would we go about actually solving the problem of unconscious projection? Well, the answer is quite simple, uh, but I'm going to go a little bit more in detail than this. But the answer is to simply make our projections more conscious to us. That way we can actually see when we're doing it and we can start to see the reality that underlies those projections. All right, so here are five basic steps for becoming aware that we're projecting. The first one is to be able to separate out belief from reality itself. And what you'll find is that most of what we think we know about reality is just our beliefs. It's our uh, mental projection that we put over reality. And so we want to see what we're actually seeing. And so essentially we want to get directly in touch with what we're experiencing right now in the present moment 
even if we didn't have the capacity to create projections over it. So let's say we weren't able to access any of our previous knowledge about anything. We weren't able to access our memory or our ability for reasoning and our mental uh, faculties in the sense of the thoughts that come up in the mind were completely gone away. And so we're not getting caught up in the fodder of the mind. And then we can focus on the six channels of experience, one of which is thought. And thought occurs as an actual experience, but then there's also the content within the thoughts. And then we have the perceptions that are taken up by our five senses. So we have what we're actually seeing. So try to see what you're actually seeing beyond just what you believe about what you're seeing. Or whenever you're hearing something, try to get in touch with what a sound really is without placing a meaning on top of it. So if you hear the word horse, try to hear it without thinking about the animal horse. You know, and try to really see how far apart the sound horse is from the actual reality that it describes. And this will actually help you get grounded more in reality as well. Um, and all of these steps should really help you do that. All right, and the second one is quite similar to that one. So the next thing is to separate reality from our interpretations about reality. So uh, this one's similar in the sense that, you know, if we look at something and we're sort of projecting an idea onto it, but it's different in the sense that we're seeing something happen and then we're like sort of figuring it out and figuring out what it means to us. One way that I practiced this before without really even thinking about it in terms of consciousness work was when I was an art student um, and I was taking a class and it was, oh, I forget what it was, uh, but we were doing a lot of different uh, types of like either 2D and 3D artwork and my professor, Sarah, she had us do a critique one time where we had to literally just say what was happening, you know? So it was always, you know, the tendency to get into it and start interpreting right away. So we would see like, let's say like a small installation of like a bunch of blocks that are like sitting on the ground and are like positioned a certain way. And we would immediately start going into like our interpretations of like, oh, I like how this works. I think that this angle works with that, or I think this means that, or this reminds me of that and coming up with all kinds of different associations. But for this critique, she had us just perceive of what was going on without actually adding any of our own ideas onto it. And so for that, let's say installation of blocks, we would say, oh, the blocks are made of wood. The blocks are on the ground. There are 15 of those blocks. That one block is at a diagonal angle. And so we were actually just perceiving of what we saw there as opposed to forming opinions or interpretations about it. And then from that basis of actually being able to become aware of what was going on, we could then make more informed interpretations of what was going on from there. So once we actually established that it's on the floor, this installation, we could say, oh, I think that the floor lends itself well as this uh, installation because it seems like something that people could walk over to and like look down on it. It can be interacted with in that way, which would mean this and that and the other thing. Or you could say that, oh, well, I see that it's on the floor, but I don't necessarily think that works for the meaning of the piece because blah, 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 blah. You know, and so we could get more in depth with our critiques when we actually realized what was going on first and just solidified the reality that we may have looked over or, you know, just kind of had blind spots to. And then we could actually have a more interesting critique from that point onward. And for the third one, and this one has more to do with psychological projection, is to notice when we're actually projecting things onto other people that we don't explicitly know. And then we can also think like what needs, desires, um, and just subconscious baggage are we actually projecting onto that person. So if we project onto a person who is quiet, that they're quiet because they're a mean person or that they dislike us in some way, we should then see, hey, I'm not actually seeing any evidence in reality to suggest that. I'm just making this interpretation of them. And so why is it that I interpret that? Is it something that I'm insecure about? Or is it something that I do to others sometime? And I'm afraid now that there's a person doing it to me and that's what I'm projecting onto them. And so it's just a matter of really questioning our interpretation of other people's motives and their thought processes and how they generally work. 
All right, the fourth step is also quite similar to the first step, and that's to start becoming aware of reality in terms of being in different channels of experience. So oftentimes those six channels of experience that I mentioned earlier, the thought plus the five senses, they get all mixed up together to where we're like in this situation. And it's difficult for us to focus on one or in particular or to sort of sort out things that are coming at us all at once. But if we can sort of stop and then look at them piecemeal and just look at one field of perception at a time, what we can see is that things work in a much more simple way um, than we were anticipating. So if we stop to just look at our visual plane, you know, we see that it's just a bunch of shapes imbued with colors. It doesn't really have, you know, any kind of depth to it that we perceive. We only perceive that because of our tactile sensations and our sensory field and our, um, the fact that we have interpret, uh, that we have basically interacted with reality a particular way and found there to be a relationship there between the tactile sensations and what we're seeing in reality. But the reality is that the visual field is always 100% flat. It's a two-dimensional plane. All right, so the next step is actually a practice that I recommend, and it's something that I've noticed myself whenever I've tried to do this. And, you know, I think it's one of the best ways to really notice the projection mechanism at work. So what you would do is you'd get into a meditative state, or if you wanted to, you could just sit down normal. You don't even really have to be in a state of meditation. You're just trying to notice a particular thought process at work here. And what you do is you try to become aware of every sensation in your body and all at once. So like for example, you're feeling all the sensations on your feet and your legs all the way up to the top of your head. And even the smallest sensation like air hitting your face lightly or you know uh, the sensation of the tongue inside of your mouth and so you try to become aware of all of this and what will happen is that you find that the mind it really tries to map this thing out to be able to make it more comprehensible and so it might create a visual model for what these sensations sort of look like or you know like try to almost superimpose like feeling over certain areas of the body so that we can stay aware of those things and so what you'll notice is that the mind will struggle to do this and will struggle to get full awareness of what's going on but the problem is that in struggling for that awareness the mind trying to do that it's actually insulating you from the reality itself and so give that a try and it's re a really interesting struggle to notice like if you're trying to become more aware but then you're trying to use projection to become more aware and to make sure that you're actually like experiencing what you're experiencing like you know you're experiencing it but your mind wants to feel like it's experiencing it so it tries to create a model of it so it's really interesting to notice anyway so that's all I have for you for now I hope that you enjoyed this video if you did you know share it with a friend go ahead leave me a comment down below click the like button subscribe all of that jazz um, also I want to say thank you so much to my patrons you know you guys really help keep me motivated to make a new video every week um, and also I wanted to mention that I still have my guinea pig program going where you know I'm offering life coachings so if that's something that you're interested in go ahead and check out my patreon page I'm offering either one session per month or two sessions per month and they're an hour long and they'd be through Skype and essentially what life coaching is is that I would help you sort of untangle barriers to whatever goals you have so if that's something you think you'd be interested in go ahead and click the link below also, if you're interested in receiving notification about whenever I post videos, go ahead and click the little bell icon below, um, and that'll give you notification through YouTube whenever I post a video. Or what you can do is you can go to the diamondnet.org and just enter in your name and your email address, and I'll send out one email per week to let you know, hey, I've just released a video, and I never send any spam. Um, and yeah, so that's all I have for you for now, and until next time, keep becoming more you. Thank mm -hmm. you.